This is not one of those like simple, what's for dessert, you only need a hand mixer kind of recipes. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. Welcome to my home kitchen. Today I have a little bit of a special recipe for you. So my good friend Vinny got married. Wave hi Vinny. And I made the wedding cake. I'm gonna make a smaller at-home version. I made, you know, a bigger, more elaborate cake for the wedding. This is so I can transport the frosting to the venue. It was so much fun and it's a great recipe. It's a tiramisu inspired wedding cake. So here it is, I'm gonna show you how to make it. So I've done now, this was my third wedding cake. It's not something I do for just anyone. Nice. <laughs> and actually all of the wedding cakes have traveled, so nothing has been local for me. So it really becomes more of like a logistics thing and a puzzle and math than even like, it's, it's equal parts that plus baking. For the entire story of how I did all the wedding cakes and got them to Texas where the wedding was, you can check out my Patreon where you have like a really fun video of like lots of highlights of the process. Today I'm showing you a scaled down version of just the recipe itself, which is gonna make one eight inch layer cake. So obviously not a full scale wedding cake because that's, we can't shoot that in one day. Vinny is a huge coffee lover. Shaylin is a tiramisu lover. So that was where I, I pulled flavors with those you know notes in mind to create this cake. So obviously we have a lot going on here. The recipe has three main components. It has a sponge cake, it has a filling, and it has a frosting. So this is everything you'll need. It's a lot of repeat ingredients. It's like sugar here, sugar there, sugar over there, lots of eggs. I make a sponge cake. It's a very, very light cake, which was important to me in thinking about, you know, what do you want to eat at a wedding? It's a lot of repeat ingredients, but I'm just going to go down the line. We got a lot to cover today. Whole milk, egg whites, unflavored powdered gelatin, sugar, cream of tartar, cornstarch, unsalted butter, semi-sweet chocolate, vanilla beans, whole coffee beans, egg yolks, olive oil, buttermilk, vanilla extract, whole eggs which I'm going to separate, cake flour, more sugar, baking soda, baking powder, more kosher salt, I have espresso and more olive oil, some vanilla paste, more unsalted butter, cream cheese, mascarpone, powdered sugar. We are gonna use a stand mixer to make this. It's gonna make the whole process a lot easier. You'll need a sheet tray, a standard half sheet tray, which is 13 by 18 for baking the sponge. If you don't have a silicone baking mat, use parchment paper. And you wanna grease just the bottom, but not the sides of the pan so that the parchment has something that it kind of adheres to and, and lies down flat, but don't grease the sides. That's just gonna be better for the sponge overall. A saucepan whisk bowls for making the filling, and you will need an eight inch cake pan or spring form pan for assembling the cake. We're gonna make it inside of a cake pan. Okay, so I actually don't have an eight inch cake pan here, but late last night when I was trying to figure out like what am I gonna do, I realized that this <laughs> saucepan is an eight inch diameter and straight sides, so I built the cake in here. So you can get creative. Anytime there's a problem, just know there's probably a creative solution. So we'll use that. Before I get into the recipe, I want to thank our sponsor of today's episode, Vital Farms. So Vital Farms is super committed to animal welfare and to ethical eating. They work with over 300 small family farms, all of which are committed to pasture raising their hens. There's at least 108 square feet of roaming space for each hen. And I notice a difference when I crack open a Vital Farms egg. The yolk is always super vibrant like holds together, I know that that hen is leading a healthy life. So one of the coolest features is if you go to the side of the box, there's a link to their traceability page where you can get a 360 like video feed of all the beautiful hens that are laying the eggs in your carton. So check that out. So I raise chickens, but I need more eggs than they produce for my recipe testing. These are my eggs of choice. And also don't forget to check out their butter. So eggs are at a premium right now. And so we're excited to partner with Vital Farms to bring you a really exciting giveaway. If you go to the information below in the description, you can enter to win a year's supply of Vital Farms eggs and butter. If you're a baker, that's the dream. So check it out. Thank you so much to Vital Farms. And now let's get into the recipe. The first component in this tiramisu inspired cake is the sponge. Rather than baking individual layers, I'm going to bake a slab of chiffon 
in a standard half sheet tray, and then I'm gonna cut out the layers. Chiffon is a style of sponge cake, so it's lightened with beaten egg whites. So I'm going to just make sure you have your whisk attachment. I have cake flour here. Cake flour is important for sponge cake because you want lots of tenderness and lightness. I'm gonna add baking powder, baking soda, and kosher salt. This has a little bit of chemical leavener, that baking powder and baking soda, which is a great insurance policy. Not working on a very large thing, but that's okay. So the first step I wanna do is whisk my yolks and some of the sugar. So I have six eggs that I separated from our Vital Farms eggs. I'm gonna work in a large bowl. So I'm gonna fold everything together in here. I have a cup of sugar. I'm gonna add about half to my yolks and reserve the other half for whipping the whites. So you can eyeball this. So I'm gonna whisk this together really well. I actually already combined all of my liquid ingredients, mostly because I was running out of containers. So here I have a half cup of buttermilk and a half cup of olive oil, plus vanilla extract. Obviously this separates and I have oil at the top, so I'm gonna stream in the oil first, very convenient. Chiffon is an oil-based cake. As I said, I'm using olive oil because I love the flavor and it goes so well with the other flavors in the cake. But it also has a dairy component. So often it's milk, I'm using buttermilk which I think also kind of increases the tenderness. So it's gonna go right in. And it just makes such a flexible, moist, absorbent sponge cake. It's so good. So that was all my liquid. Now I'm gonna add my dry ingredients. You just want a nice, smooth mixture and the, that flour will thicken this quite a bit. Okay, so that is our base. Make sure the bowl of your mixer is really clean. If there's any oil or fat or any kind of residue, it's gonna inhibit the whipping of the whites. So make sure the bowl is clean and also the whisk attachment. I have some cream of tartar here. Cream of tartar is an acid. It helps to stabilize egg whites. And I'm also gonna add just a, a little pinch of salt, which is also kind of a good stabilizer for egg whites. If you watch the show, you've seen me beat egg whites a million times and I always say the same thing. There's kind of a set technique. It's better if they're room temp, they're gonna whip up more easily and faster. And start to beat them on like medium low to break up those whites, which really like to hold together. Once you see that the whites have gone from like greenish yellow and translucent to white and foamy and opaque, I'm gonna start to stream in the sugar. You're gonna add the sugar very slowly. I'm gonna beat this on medium high. This is gonna help form a nice glossy, dense, stable meringue. You don't want to add too much sugar too quickly, so I just let it kind of slowly cascade into the bowl. I want to keep beating this until I have nice, firm peaks, but not more than that, because if you overbeat egg whites, they start to clump together and get grainy, and then that's really hard to incorporate into the batter. So I'm gonna test out the texture. I think we're there. That's a nice, firm peak. So now it's time to fold these into our yolky base. So I'm gonna start by scraping about a third of the egg whites into this bowl. And now I'm gonna fold this together. So folding is a very gentle mixing method and usually it's employed when you have one or more light airy components where you wanna maintain that volume. So I'm gonna add another half of the remaining. And folding in batches just helps for the most even mixing. And you actually end up mixing less than you would I think if you were just to try to combine all of it at once definitely be using a bigger bowl. The whole point of a sponge cake is it's kind of a blank <coughs> canvas for absorbing flavors. So all of those air bubbles turn into like little tiny cells that hold soak and other flavors that you add to the cake. So you wanna mix just until it's streak free, which this is, and then no more, because you don't wanna deflate it. So I'm gonna scrape this onto my lined sheet tray. If you have three eight inch cake pans, that's great, you can use those, but this is just a way to quickly bake all of it at once and you don't need so many pans to pop any really large air bubbles. Give it a little tap on the counter. Then you have a more uniform texture in your cake. So I have all that batter in an even layer. I'm gonna pop it into my oven. It's at 350 and it's gonna bake until the surface is gonna be super puffed, really evenly golden brown, springy to the touch. It takes about 18 to 20 minutes. I was looking for a filling that was very light and airy and creamy, but would also hold its shape. And in all of my research, I kind of settled on a particular preparation called creme chibouste. It is basically pastry cream that is lightened with 
Italian meringue, and set with gelatin. I wanted to incorporate both coffee and chocolate flavors because tiramisu gets that dusting of cocoa on top. So I'm going to start by steeping the milk for my pastry cream with some vanilla and some whole coffee beans. Three tablespoons of coffee beans. I have here a cup and a half of milk. This will get strained out. Then I'm going to scrape my vanilla bean and add the seeds. If you don't have want to use a vanilla bean, you could just use vanilla extract and add it at the end. You could use vanilla paste, that's great. I'm also gonna add my salt, just a little bit of salt. So to split a vanilla bean, grab a paring knife. And some people split the entire thing in half lengthwise, but I actually like to go through just one side of the bean and not cut all the way through. I like to just kind of basically create a slit in the skin. Then I open it up, I'm at the stem end, and then I just take the dull part of my knife and scrape down the entire length. And I like to go back and do it several times because I really want to remove every single little seed that's in there. And then I, this is just from half a bean. That's like a nice amount of vanilla. So I'm actually going to drop the bean in there because that pod has lots of flavor. Those seeds are going to go in as well. And now I'm going to very gently heat this because I want this to come up to temperature slowly because I want lots of time for the vanilla and the coffee to steep and release their flavor into the milk. Gelatin adds like a nice set to this preparation so that it holds its shape. So when I make, you know, the, when I assemble the cake and I chill it and I unmold it, I'm gonna have nice, like straight, even layers of filling and cake. So I have some powdered unflavored gelatin here. I'm gonna grab two tablespoons of cold water. It's important that you use cold water for a softening gelatin. You wanna sprinkle it over the water and I like to hold it up so that those granules separate and like hit the water with full contact. And you don't wanna stir. So as soon as you start to sprinkle the gelatin on there, I'm gonna let this sit for about 10 minutes. Those little granules are gonna swell as they hydrate. I have my milk mixture coming up to temp for the pastry cream. This sponge has been in like 19 minutes or so. I think it's ready, I'm gonna pull it out. You just want even golden brown all over. This looks good. It's nice and springy to the touch. So I'm gonna get it on my cooling rack to cool, but because it's such a thin layer, it cools pretty quickly. As it cools, it will settle and I'll get a really flat, even layer, which is what I want. I have cornstarch. So cornstarch is the primary thickener, I mean besides eggs, of pastry cream. I'm gonna combine three tablespoons of sugar with the cornstarch. I'm going to bring this over to the stove where I'm gonna make my pastry cream. So my milk and coffee mixture slowly came up to a simmer and then I turned it off. I have a little strainer here because obviously I don't want those coffee beans and whole vanilla pod to be in my pastry cream. So I'm gonna strain it, but first I'm going to blanch the eggs. I have my yolks, I have my mixture of cornstarch and sugar. Yolks are gonna go in. You don't wanna do this in advance because the yolks can harden in that sugar mixture. So just do this after your milk has steeped. So at first it seems like there's too much of the dry ingredients for the yolks, but it's mixed slowly and it will smooth out. And then once you have everything combined, go ahead and whisk more vigorously. It's lightening quite a bit, it's becoming really thick. You want it to have this kind of ribbony texture. So after about a minute of vigorous whisking, you're good. And now I'm gonna strain my milk mixture into the eggs, a little bit at a time. This step is called tempering. I'm gently raising the temperature of the eggs by adding that hot dairy mixture a little at a time. And I'm straining. So this step allows me to separate out the solids from the milk. And all that coffee flavor and vanilla flavor have been infused into the milk. I didn't realize you did all this for us. What did you think, I like phoned it in? <laughs> Vinny and Shailen get chocolate pudding mix? <laughs> Absolutely not. Actually, I have a bunch of vanilla seeds in the pot, but I'm leaving those. I want the vanilla seeds. So here's all my solids. I can get rid of this. Actually, I do save the vanilla bean. I rinse it off and I stick it in my homemade vanilla mix. So again, I'm off the heat right now. There's no heat under the saucepan. I am going to transfer this mixture back into the saucepan. And just in the interest of not generating a million dishes, I just wanna quickly, before I cook this, rinse this bowl, and I'm gonna get my chocolate and butter into here. Everything will get transferred to this bowl with, after the pastry cream is cooked, and I'll be able to assemble the filling right in here. I have my butter and my chocolate. Are gonna, those are gonna go right into the bowl. And now I'm gonna cook the pastry cream. So you wanna pay extra attention here and really make sure that you're not letting any area 
sit for too long, like constant whisking is what you want to do. And the idea here is that the eggs are having a chance. They're going to cook and they're going to like, you know, set, but it's going to be evenly distributed throughout. I'm not going to have any curds or little bits of cooked egg. Okay, so this is starting to thicken. You'll notice that the foam will subside quite a bit. When it holds the marks of the whisk, that's when I'm going to stop. I'm going to immediately scrape it into my bowl with my chocolate and butter. And it's pretty evenly cooked. I don't really have lots of like curdling or anything, so I'm just gonna go ahead and scrape this whole thing out. If you have any scorching on the bottom or you feel like in that little area where the sides meets the bottom, you have some overcooked pastry cream, don't scrape that in. And I'm now actually gonna reuse this saucepan twice. All of that heat from the pastry cream is gonna melt the chocolate and the butter. And now I've created something that's mocha flavored. Looks good. Yeah, chocolate pudding, mocha pudding. Here is my gelatin. This has softened. I know that because it's like super firm and bouncy to the touch. So this is ready to get melted. So clean saucepan. I didn't really wash it, I just rinsed it. The whole thing comes out like in one piece because it's just become this like solid block, just like that. Into the saucepan. I'm gonna turn it on low slash medium low. It kind of depends on the strength of your stove. But you wanna melt gelatin gently. You don't want to let it boil and put it over really high heat because if you boil this, it tends to destroy some of the setting power of the gelatin. It immediately starts to melt with any amount of heat. And now all I do is scrape this into my pastry cream and stir it really well. The final step in making my filling is to cook my Italian meringue and then that gets folded in and then we're ready to assemble our cake layers. Meringue is a mixture of egg whites and sugar that's beaten together, but there's a lot of ways you could assemble it. So with an Italian meringue, you actually cook the sugar into a syrup, stream that into the egg whites as you're whipping them. It creates a very, very stable meringue. So this is a half cup of sugar. Goes into the bottom of the saucepan. I have an instant read thermometer because I want to monitor the temperature. I'm going to cook this to 238 Fahrenheit. And I'm going to add a couple tablespoons of water. So the water will facilitate the dissolving of the sugar. So before I cook this, I wanna just go over my setup for the egg whites. I'm gonna get the egg whites into the bowl of my stand mixer, which is really clean. I'm gonna add a pinch of cream of tartar and a pinch of salt. And then I'm gonna pivot back to cooking this. And I, I kinda of have to balance the two processes of like whipping the egg whites and cooking the sugar, but I'll talk about that as it's happening. So I put this over medium high-ish heat. In the very beginning, as it's coming up to temp, you can stir. So stirring will just help to get that sugar dissolved. I'm just actually very gently stirring. I have a pastry brush here and some water for washing down the sides of the saucepan. It might not actually be necessary, but I have it there just in case. And it's gonna come up to a boil. So I get the brush kind of loaded with water and then I brush it against the sides and I let the water kind of drip down and it dissolves any sugar granules stuck against the side of the pot. Like the pastry cream, this is a really small volume of sugar syrup. It's gonna come up to temperature pretty quickly. When it hits 230, between 225 and 230, is when I'm gonna start my egg whites because I don't wanna stream this into just liquid egg whites. I wanna stream it into egg whites that are nice and foamy and that's gonna help it gain the maximum volume. I have an instant thermometer. I have to tilt the pan actually because I don't even really have enough depth in there to like take an accurate reading. So I'm at 223-ish. I'm gonna start my mixer. Normally I would have the mixer a little bit closer to my stove. But as soon as it hits that temp, I'm gonna pull it off the heat and bring it over to my mixer. If you need to stop the mixer, let's say you already hit soft peaks on your egg whites and you still have a ways to go on your syrup, you can stop the mixer and then come back to it. I'm at 228 about, and you can swirl to help equalize the temperature. So my syrup hit 238. My egg whites are at soft peaks. I'm gonna turn the mixer on medium high and I'm gonna slowly pour this into the bowl. It's important that you don't hit the, the whisk attachment as you pour. So I'm gonna pour it down the side of the bowl. I have my pastry cream. I have my meringue that's whipping. I wanna whip this until I have firm peaks, but not beyond. It's actually kind of easy to over whip this meringue. So I'm nearly there. I'm just gonna whip for another few seconds. So now I want to fold this into my pastry cream. Nice firm peak, nice glossy dense meringue. Go ahead and give your pastry cream a bit of a whisk to smooth it out because it will kind of start to set as it cools. 
Now grab a nice big flexible spatula and I'm going to incorporate the egg whites in three additions into the pastry cream, about a third at a time. This is gonna lighten it so much. It's also gonna kind of stabilize it. It's adding the sweetness that it needs. Do you think of Elliot Stabler every time you think, say stabilize? No, but now I will. Do you load this into a cake pan and bake it? That's such an interesting question, Cal. I wonder what would happen if you baked it. There's no flour in it, so it wouldn't really become cake-like. It's basically, I just thought of this, minus the gelatin, it is essentially a modified souffle batter. The gelatin might make it weird, but you would basically have a souffle if you baked this. And when chilled, because of the gelatin, it basically becomes mousse. It's a very stable mousse. So my filling is basically done. You wanna mix just until it's streak-free, like the sponge. And what's nice about this, because of the stability of the meringue, th there's some work time here. Like, this can just sit. So I'm gonna set this aside and get set up for assembling the cake. So I'm gonna grab my mold, I'm gonna grab my soak, and then we're gonna move on to assembly. My sponge has cooled. It has settled into this really nice, flat, even layer. I have my filling ready to go. I don't have my eight inch cake pan here, so I just kind of looked around my kitchen, realized that I have this saucepan with straight sides and an eight inch diameter, so I'm gonna build my cake in here. I have lined it with plastic wrap. You should use a cake pan. The first step in assembly is to cut out my cake layers. I have a small serrated knife here. If you have a cake pan, you can use the cake pan as your form. You can use a cake round. This is just an eight inch like salad plate, so I'm gonna use this. It fits right inside the pan. So I'm gonna get three layers from the sheet tray. But really I'm gonna get two whole layers and then two halves that form the third round. You can actually kind of just score like where you're gonna cut and then go back and really cut through. You don't wanna go right up to the very edge because there's a little bit of a slope on the pan. So you wanna give it maybe a quarter inch in. But you're not resting the plate on there. I'm not resting the plate on there. Just if, if I had a cardboard cake round, I would just set the cake round down and then cut around, but the cake's kind of heavy and I don't want to squish the sponge. I'm just going to go in with my knife and in little tiny like back and forth, up and down motion, cut out my layer. Now one thing that's very common in sponge cakes is you get this sort of sticky smooth layer on the very surface that is a mixture of sugar and egg. You actually want to peel it off because one, the texture isn't that appealing and two, it exposes the sponge cake underneath and it creates like a nicer surface for soaking. But if you just gently rub your fingers over the surface, the people in my family, I come from a family, people that love to like peel, my mom like loves peeling labels off of stuff. My mom would love this. So then this is just garbage. So that's layer one. I'm not gonna pull it out yet. I'm just gonna cut out my other layers. I'm gonna fit the second one right next to the first. There's gonna be some leftover sponge, which frankly makes a fantastic accompaniment to the leftover filling that you're gonna have. So, you know, you can make the cake and then why not make like a little mocha trifle with the cake scraps and the leftover filling. You can make little cake croutons and eat it on a Sunday. So that's the second layer. I'm gonna give this a peel. You could also just, pull the entire film off of the whole sheet and then cut the layers, it's really up to you. The layer that's two halves goes in the center of the cake and it really disguises it so you'll never actually even be able to tell that you have two pieces of cake in there instead of one. So I'm going to remove my layers from the tray and just get them on my rack. This part's so fun, you just get to like literally peel away the cake. So you can see there's this beautiful, like super fluffy, light, even beautiful cake layer. I can smell the olive oil. It has such a nice aroma. That's the bottom. You can see that the bottom has like such a beautiful, a very different texture than the top. But I'm actually gonna soak that side because that has more holes. So it will suck the soak down into the interior. Now this leftover sponge, you can do what you want with it. Peel it off or don't peel it off. This is bonus. Let's get this assembly going. I have my mold, my soaks, which I haven't really talked about yet. I'm gonna soak these with olive oil. That's gonna give like nice, vibrant, fresh olive oil flavor and espresso. Unsweetened, I'm not adding any sweetness here. This is going to add a ton of flavor and also enhance the texture. I'm gonna start with a layer of sponge down into my mold. Make sure the plastic is out of the way. So next up, I have my pastry brush. I'm gonna do a layer, a once over dab of espresso. I'm gonna drizzle a little olive oil. Then in between the layers is a scant two cups of filling. So I'm just gonna get everything going, layered in, middle layer, top layer, everything soaked, 
and then nice wrapped up and it goes into the fridge. Pretty. Such a good color, it's like fluorescent. Assembly is done. I am gonna take the overhanging plastic and just wrap it up and over the surface of the cake. I want everything to be nicely sealed because this has to chill and to set. I don't wanna picking up any off like aromas from the fridge. Just giving it a little pat to make sure everything is even and there's no big air pockets in there. But this looks great. So this is gonna go into the fridge. It should set for, I mean, ideally overnight. I would say 12 hours is good. If you are in time crunch, I would say six at a minimum. I have a version that I made last night. I'm gonna take that out. Then I'm gonna unwrap the plastic from the surface, invert a plate over top of the saucepan or cake pan, whatever you're using, then invert everything together, get that cake on my serving platter, and then we're ready to frost it. Final step of the cake process is the mascarpone frosting. So the mascarpone frosting is really cream cheese frosting, masquerading as mascarpone frosting. But of course the mascarpone is there to enhance the kind of tiramisu quality of all of the flavors. It's so easy and I chose this frosting for the cake because it is a palatable frosting when it's cold. So the cake needs to be chilled for that filling to be set. And that just means that the frosting is also gonna be cold. And if I were to use like a traditional buttercream that's like super butter based, it's gonna harden and you're gonna slice it. It's gonna kind of crack. It's not as appealing. So I love this option because not only does it fit with the flavors of the cake, but it also texturally does what I need it to do. I have equal parts mascarpone, cream cheese, and butter. So four ounces each. So this is gonna go right into my stand mixer. I have the paddle on here instead this time. Then my mascarpone, my cream cheese. Then to that, I'm gonna add just a pinch of salt. The cream cheese and mascarpone already have salt added, so just a little bit. Then a generous amount of vanilla paste. So I'm gonna give it like a couple big squeezes. I like seeing a little flex of vanilla all throughout the frosting. So I want to just slowly and briefly beat this all together until it's smooth. So now, I just got everything kind of combined. I'm going to add my powdered sugar. If you have very lumpy or like stubborn lumps in your powdered sugar, go ahead and sift it, but usually it's not necessary. So I have two cups, just so I don't get it everywhere. I'm gonna take the bowl out. And I add it all at once. And now I'm gonna mix very, very slowly because if I were to blast it on high, it would like, it would just go everywhere. You can even kind of pulse it in, by which I mean like short little off on offs like that. So everything is really well combined. I want to scrape down the sides of the bowl and the paddle. So just make sure you get any unincorporated sugar from around the sides plus any butter or cream cheese or mascarpone that's hiding at the very bottom of the bowl. The frosting is just the coating on the cake. It's not going between the layers, so I don't need that much. It's very smooth, but it needs to get, it needs to be aerated a little. So I'm gonna turn this on like medium high and let it go into the, in the mixer. It's going to aerate, get a little fluffy and light. And in the meantime, I'm gonna grab the cake and a small offset spatula. It's time to frost. The frosting is done. I regret that in a moment, in a lapse of judgment, I didn't put it on my cake stand. Let me see if I can get this off of here. So one quick thing to note, this is my chilled cake. I had a top layer of soak on the cake when I was forming it. And when you invert it, that soak goes onto the bottom. So I have this nice, clean, exposed, like unsoaked layer of cake on top. I just am worried that the soak is gonna stick really bad to the plate, but let's see what happens. But at the same time, it's kind of been greased by the olive oil. Ah, nothing to see here. I'm gonna peel off the plastic. I have my beautiful cake, nice and chilled, so everything has set. So when the crumb is exposed like that, it's a good idea to, to do what's called a crumb coat, which is a very thin application of frosting over every surface. And any crumbs that come off of the cake get like stuck 
to the sides and then you chill it and then you add another layer of frosting. I'm gonna play a little fast and loose and actually skip the crumb coat, although I did crumb coat Vinny's cakes. So when I frost a cake, the best thing to do, I think, is to apply more frosting than you'll need and then take it away. It's just easier than adding more. I'm gonna scrape everything on top. This is definitely more than I'll need. And now I'm gonna use my small offset spatula to work it down the sides and across the surface. Frosting's a little broken. I guess I over whipped it a little. It'll be fine. I'll be able to tell. I actually thought the cakes mini could have had even a thicker layer of frosting. So I'm gonna actually be really generous here because again, there isn't any frosting between the layers. So any chance you get for it to get some of that like, creamy mascarpone tanginess is just gonna be on the outside. Did you think a lot about it after you're done? Like things you yeah. Can change? Yeah, there was actually another thing in the cakes that I didn't show you here, which was a layer of these like crunchy pearls that I added into each layer. Because Harris's feedback about the cake when I was testing it before the wedding was like, it's good, but it needs like some texture. And so he encouraged me to add these like little crunchies, which are delicious. They're like little crispy rice pearls co coated in chocolate. And I found a dark chocolate version that were really tasty and like, weren't gonna make it too sweet and they were really tiny. And so they were just gonna add this like super satisfying little pops. So I added those to each layer over top of the filling and they just dissolved. <laughs> they didn't make it unpleasant. You couldn't, you just couldn't even tell that they were there. So I skipped that here. I had originally tested with another flavor component, which was like a hazelnut. And I had a like kind of toasted hazelnut crunch that I talked myself out of. That. I thought it was too many flavors happening. Kind of feels like a lot of frosting. I think it's a lot on the top. I'm gonna work some more around the sides. Now for the wedding, for the assembly, I had a, I brought my cake turntable to make the frosting a lot easier and faster and smoother. But here I'm just spinning the cake stand, which is fine. It was an honor to have you use the mixer. Oh my God, your stand mixer. I really like the color of your stand mixer. For Vinny's cake, I did like really textured frosting. You have a nice buttercream or cream cheese frosting that's like fluffy and looks really light and like holds a nice peak. I wanna see the texture. I don't necessarily want, if it's totally smooth, the frosting, it's like, it could be cement, you know? So on Vinny's cakes, I wanted it to look like a palette knife kind of texture, like smooth, but not too smooth basically. And then I was kind of going around the sides, giving it texture like that. And then you can take off any <coughs> excess. How many people would this feed? This will feed at least 10. But my math is birthday cake portions. Wedding portions are smaller. Okay. I kind of think it's done. Time to slice the cake. What I really like about it is it has this beautiful white bridal-y, wedding-y finish, and then you slice it open and you have all those layers with the chocolate contrast. It just looks really pretty. I have a serrated knife. Serrated is good for sponge cake because if you don't have a serrated knife, you might end up compressing and like squeezing out the filling, which you don't want to do. See, the whole thing has good movement. Like it's so light. There's that gelatin filling, so delicate. You might want to like, use some hot water and clean off the blades of the knife. The blade of the knife. Harris at the wedding got me a big camera of super hot water. And at first I was like, wow, I really don't need that much hot water, but it was good to have. Look how pretty, oh my God, it looks so good. Nice even layers, it looks really beautiful. Look at how light it is. I love that actually the texture of the filling and the layers looks the same. I see so many air bubbles. I can just tell from looking at it, it's gonna be so light and like dissolve in your mouth and creamy. I actually think the proportion of frosting to layers is really nice. It's generous, but it's not too much and it's not overwhelming. Can I please taste it? My mouth is watering. Absolutely. Okay. Mm. I actually get the olive oil toward the end. It is a pleasant bitterness, definitely different and distinct from the coffee and chocolate in the filling. It's so light. I love the combination of espresso, olive oil, and chocolate, plus the creamy mascarpone frosting. This is definitely a cake where it's, it's about everything together, eaten as one, not about like the cake being separate from the frosting, you know, that the entire thing is kind of one dish. It's like a wedding. It's like a wedding. It's all about multiple, I guess just two people. Joining together right. as one. Right. Mm. I don't want to say it's not sweet. It's certainly sweet. This is dessert, but it is not a cake that overwhelms with sweetness. I'm so happy with this cake. This is my scaled down, eight inch, manageable, three layer version of Vinnie and Shaylin's wedding cake, which was a much bigger project, but here I have all of the flavors incorporated. It is my tiramisu inspired wedding cake. This cake 
is as delicious as it is because of the eggs and how we use the eggs in here. So I want to thank our sponsor, Vital Farms, for supplying the eggs, making such a wonderful product. You can enter our giveaway. If you look at the information below, you can win a year's supply of Vital Farms butter and eggs, which is just incredible for all you bakers out there. So thank you so much. We're going to bring you more episodes of Dessert Person, more recipes from What's for Dessert. So thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>